uh, focusing on ancient Greece, the birth of philosophy, which was supposed to be covered last week. And we will also combine that with the life and death of Socrates. So we'll be uh, looking from about 600 BC to roughly 400 BC, those uh, 200 year, uh, that 200 year period. Um, there are the ruins of ancient Greece, as you can see uh, in the uh, PowerPoint. So I'm very excited. I've got a lot of content for everybody today. Hopefully you'll find this very educational. Feel free to take notes. If you want to get the most out of it, I recommend it. Uh, if you just want to relax and uh, sort of be more passive uh, in the education of, in your education on this, that's fine as well. So it's completely up to you. All right, um, let's go. Uh, this is the basic lesson plan for today. Uh, we'll be focusing on why philosophy began, uh, why it began at the time that it did, and we'll look at those first two points on Thales and Heraclitus and the others. Uh, those are some of the very earliest philosophers in history. Uh, we're looking at Western philosophy here. I won't be covering much on uh, Eastern philosophy or other traditions. Uh, and there was a big struggle, of course, to reconcile logic and reason with observed data. And you see this kind of conflict throughout philosophy all the time. Uh, it culminated in its modern version in the uh, rationalism empiricism debate from sort of the 16th to the 19th century. Um, which we'll cover in a few weeks. But uh, it actually began even before Plato and Aristotle, and we will look at the very beginnings of that. Uh, I just, is everybody able to hear me on the uh, online chat? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, if there's any problem, just yell it out because uh, I, I won't know about it. I'm just looking at the PowerPoint slide. So uh, please tell me as soon as, as soon as possible if you can't hear me or if the PowerPoint isn't transitioning or something like that. Okay, um, now uh, we'll also examine Greek aesthetics, uh, Greek science. Of course, it's not science in the modern sense. They didn't even have uh, an understanding of atoms, although uh, such a theory was proposed by um, one of the philosophers who we'll look at very brief briefly. Um, then we'll take a break. It won't be that soon. It'll be a bit behind that uh, because we started a bit later. Uh, and then we'll do a group activity, which for you guys, it'll just be all of you discussing it, maybe on the same table. Uh, for people online, uh, you can discuss it amongst yourselves. Uh, just sort of when, when we get to the group activity, I'll make you aware of it and you can just uh, unmute yourselves and discuss. Um, great. And then we will do life and death of Socrates and uh, we'll do questions after each of the two respective uh, sort of courses, mini courses. Okay, let's go. So the first uh, philosopher we have is Thales. Miletus is the region of Greece he was from. Here's what we know about him. Well, that's obvious. We don't even know when he was born and when he died. Uh, that is roughly uh, the years that we have. Only four of his sentences survived, and you'll, you'll see what those are in a second. This is just the, the detriments of being around in 600 BC. You know, very little of what you achieve gets preserved because he was known to be a polymath and he uh, uh, studied astronomy and all of that. But, you know, and after all this, uh, we're discussing him in 2023 AD and we've got four sentences left. He would be pretty disappointed, I think. Um, uh, main contributions is, uh, were to cosmology and metaphysics, which uh, we'll discuss in a bit more detail, is the study of reality as a whole, really fundamental questions like what is the world made of, and metaphysics and epistemology, so what is the world made of, what is the nature of reality, is time linear, and so on. These are all metaphysical questions, uh, and then the question of how we know all that is subsumed under the subcategory of uh, philosophy called epistemology. So the only accurate date we have of Thales' life was this date, which by the modern calendar would be May 28th. And we know this because we, can, we now have the ability to see when all the eclipses occurred, just using basic physics. Uh, and we, we looked at when he you know, wrote this, we tracked it back, and we concluded it must have been by the modern calendar, May 28th, uh, 585 BC. 
Now, I'm actually going to be celebrating this day. Uh, it's called Thales Day. Very little known uh, celebration. Only for, you know people really interested in Greek philosophy would, would ever celebrate this. But I think it's an important day because it celebrates, uh, in effect, the birth of human thought and human reason. Uh, as you know, an eclipse is, uh, is a, it depends if it's a lunar or a solar eclipse, uh, but basically it refers to the alignment of um, the moon and the earth and the sun in some order. So let's go to the four sentences that Aristotle, who came about uh, 300 years after Thales, uh, wrote about Thales. So here are the four sentences. Uh, this is often translated as all things are water. Now, why would somebody think this? You know, you look at nature and you see water only in some places and you see completely dry things in others and doesn't look like there's any water there. It's a good question and indeed he's wrong, of course, to say this. If, if we just define water as H2O, indeed, it's not, it's not found in many, many things. Why did he think this, though? He was trying, firstly, to uh, reconcile all matter under a single concept. Remember, this is, this is like the world's first intellectual. He had no one to go off. Any knowledge we have of science comes from other people, comes from millennia of discovery and investigation. Thales didn't have this luxury. He had to figure it out from the very beginning. And he thought, okay, so there must be something in common with all physical reality. We now know that it's atoms, and these atoms can be divided into various elements, which are found in the periodic table. But how was he to know that? Uh, he thought, okay, well, we see water flowing, we see rain, we see the evaporation of water. Uh, what does the water evaporate into? Well, he saw it evaporates and then it seems to disappear when it gets thin enough. So he concluded that the air must be water as well in a very kind of uh, low density. Uh, he also thought, okay, when uh, water rains on the ground, plants spring up. So the plants must be made of water. That was kind of his reasoning. Uh, of course, he couldn't explain why these things all looked different. Uh, but that's just really a hypothesis that he, he put forward. Uh, he wasn't dogmatic about this at all. But we do get this uh, sentence, all things are water. And I think it represents a great achievement uh, of Thales to make this kind of leap, however incorrect it is scientifically, because uh, it was an integrative kind of process. Uh, he, he tried to find the one in the many. And this pattern of Trying to find the one in the many is something that characterizes uh, Greece as a like as a philosophic culture uh, completely. So it's the exact opposite of trying to break things apart, which we see in sort of 16th to 19th century philosophy with rationalism, empiricism, Kant, and so on. He's trying to put things together. He's trying to say, what is the world stuff? Uh, he thought it was water. Okay. Well, okay, there's a sort of another wrong uh, metaphysical, uh, con physical conception. He thought that the earth was flat and floated upon a sea of this uh, uh, on water. I, I actually have no idea how you would explain this. <laughs> uh, w you know, I would actually recommend you do, do your own research. I, I didn't look into that one very much, why he thought that all things would be full of gods. Okay, and there you go. He actually made an observation about magnetism. Was he right to attribute it to a soul? Probably not. But uh, you see, they, they were really amused by the world. They wanted to understand the world and see why it worked the way it did. So it's quite impressive considering just how early this was and how uh, they didn't have anything modern, anything industrial. They just had nature and they were just looking at this and exercising their mind. So let's move on from Thales. Uh, after Thales, of course, there were several other philosophers. Uh, there are hundreds of philosophers in ancient Greece that are known, but I'm just covering the three or four main ones. Uh, Heraclitus came just after uh, Thales. What are his dates? All right, I don't have his dates, but uh, he rejected this idea that we should be looking at the building block of all matter. Uh, he actually tried very hard to identify the building block of all physical reality, and he couldn't do it. He looked, uh, he, he basically disagreed with Thales for common sense reasons. He said, well, how, how can you really assert that 
a plant and rock and air are the same thing if you're saying they're all water. Um, and he cited fire as a counterexample because fire is a thing, it exists, and yet when you pour water on it, it disappears. So if it were made of water, why would it react that way to water? Um, now, from Heraclitus, he did much better than Thales. We've got 140 uh, surviving sentences instead of six. So uh, I think he'd be happy about that, though he was uh, apparently a misanthrope. He really hated people. <laughs> OK. Struggled to integrate all matter into a single constituent. As I said, I just made this point. He couldn't find the world stuff. and. Uh, he also established this interesting concept called the unity of opposites, which is saying that the way, for example, the way up a mountain is the same thing as the way down. And even though they're opposite concepts, they are just mirror images of themselves. So, okay, if you've concluded that, uh, that there is no world stuff physically, you still have to explain, you have to make some kind of explanation for what happens. There must be reasons. They didn't... Uh, they they didn't believe in you know just randomness or anything like this. Although their Heraclitus kind of did, but uh, Greece as a culture was very pro-rational. They really tried to figure out why um, why things happen. So if you can't reduce all matter to a single constituent, which Heraclitus claimed was the case, then all we have, all we observe is the fact that everything is always changing. Uh, so. There is no single thing, because as soon as you say this is a thing, you've just got to the th, and it's gone. Um, and so he comes up with, there are some famous quotes from Heraclitus. You've probably heard this, a man cannot step into the same river twice. Yeah, yeah, that's from, that's only, you know, 3,000 years old. Um, oh, two and a half thousand, yeah. For it is not the same river, and he is not the same man. So not only is all of reality changing, but you are part of reality, so you too are changing at, at every instant. Uh, now this poses, this might seem correct, but it actually poses a great threat to logic. Because if there's change, if everything's always in sort of perpetual motion, perpetual flux, uh, then nothing exists. There's only a process. Of course, that poses the question, well, what is undergoing the process? Because if there's no thing, undergoing the process, then a thing is and it isn't, which is, a, again, a contradiction. Everything is becoming, nothing is. Yeah. So that was kind of his conclusion. All right. Now, this is a, uh, Heraclitus kicked off a tradition called, uh, I don't know if he was the very first, or he was certainly one of the first, called Sophism. Uh, so the Sophists were people who effectively rejected uh, reason and integration because of this paradox posed by the concept of change. All right, now let's move on to uh, a competing figure who came after Heraclitus, and this is Parmenides. He takes the exact opposite worldview. Why? So he says, okay, you can't have a process without something undergoing the process. Aristotle agrees with this later. We will cover this in very uh, sufficient detail. Um, we'll cover this in sufficient detail uh, when we cover Aristotle in two weeks' time. But he said, okay, if, something's, if, if there's just change, you can't just have everything changing all the time because then what is the everything composed of? To be, so, to be everything, something, everything is just composed of pieces of something, right? And so that something, has to be distinct from it, some other something. Uh, and so the, they have to have different characteristics. Uh, so it's not uh, processes, but entities that are the building blocks of existence. You can't have nothing being something. Nothing is just the absence of anything. We use it to refer to nothing, like to just the absence. But we can't say that nothing is an entity. And Heraclitus did say that because he said, nothing is, everything is becoming. So again, these are just Parmenides' arguments. Um, yeah, and this is, of course, an obvious conclusion you have to draw if you're saying that uh, nothing cannot exist. You have to say that, well, we observe something exists, we observe this reality around us. Um, even if you say this reality doesn't exist, that has to only not exist in contrast to something which does exist. Because you're saying, 
uh, you know, if you say, I am uh, aware that nothing exists, it's like, well, where is your awareness then? Where, where, where is the awareness located? Does everybody get that point? Just nod or hands up if you don't. <laughs> Sorry? Pardon? That's where the unconscious comes from. Well, even if you're, you have to be conscious of something in order to even be conscious of the fact that you're not conscious of other things, right? So first you have to be conscious of something and then see yourself as distinct from that. But the point is, if you say, I'm conscious but nothing exists, that's contradictory because where are you conscious? What is the nature of your consciousness? And then to define that, you have to ascribe positive characteristics to that consciousness, which means that you're asserting existence. Um, okay. Again, the universe had no beginning. It is uncreated, eternal, indestructible. This is a really interesting and hard thing for people to grasp. Uh, let's say even though you establish that there's a Big Bang, right? Well, okay, you, you can just ask what happened before that. Now, um, various physicists and even various Christians reply, well, nothing happened before that. Time, matter, and space uh, were all created at the same exact time. But that's a contradiction as well because they were created at the same time Right? And you're saying time was created at the same time as everything else. It's like, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so uh, Aristotle addresses the issue of time, uh, and he addresses basically all the issues uh, in which we'll cover in two weeks' time. So I won't spoil it now. But uh, Parmenides uh, rebutted Heraclitus very effectively on these points. Uh, but he was, I, I think, from sort of our modern conception, we would consider him a determinist. Uh, However, he considered the dimension of time subjective. Uh, I would elaborate on that, but and I had a good point to make, but I, I just forgot it, so I'll just move on. All right. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the two big schools. So we've got um, one way to look at this, if we go back, is that Parmenides, you could say, was the first rationalist, but not in the modern sense. So he asserted uh, logic and reason at the expense of reality. And Heraclitus, you could say, was the very first empiricist, but not in the modern sense, because he asserted uh, reality, but not reason and logic. Now, let's look at some other uh, important figures in uh, Greek philosophy. Of course, Pythagoras. Everybody's heard of him in you know, high school or primary school. Uh, you've heard of Pythagoras' theorem. It's possible he didn't even come up with the theorem. It, it could have been one of his pupils. Um, but that was a kind, uh, Pythagoras was actually uh, the founder of a school of um, a kind of mysticism. So belief without reason, that's what mysticism basically means. You, you believe on faith, it's like religion or something like that, that's, that's uh, mystic, uh, mystical. And uh, th their particular brand of mysticism was numerical. Uh, so numbers had these special meanings and represented special things. Um, you can discard all that and just take his mathematics because we know that's correct. Um, but anyway, uh, interesting uh, Pythagoras, he was, you can obviously see that he was more closely uh, aligned with the philosophy of Parmenides than he was with the philosophy of Heraclitus. Right, uh, I did mention there was a philosopher who posited atoms. This is uh, Leucippus, who I didn't even hear about until I, I did the research for this. Um, but yeah, atom comes from the Greek word meaning cannot be cut. Okay, so I'll just explain this point here. Uh, Democritus basically said you can't have an effect that is uncaused. So every change has a cause. You can't just have something happen for no reason. Something There's always the, the antecedent factor. Uh, now, tele teleology is basically the idea that there's a kind of will or um, plan behind everything. So all religious people are teleologists insofar as they take the religion seriously. Um, but you don't have to be religious to be a teleologist. You just have to believe that there's um, some kind of end goal to which everything is working. Uh, so even Aristotle, uh, who was, you know, basically the father of science, uh, was in some respects a teleologist because uh, he basically said that when a tree grows, it's growing for the sake of getting to the, its, its end state, the full mature, fully mature tree. And it has this sort of goal, even from being a seed, to become this. Um, 
Now, obviously, he wasn't saying that the tree is conscious, but he is saying that there's a goal that the tree kind of has, even though it's not aware of it, because it doesn't have a faculty of awareness. Um, now, when I say metaphysical phenomena, that just means, um, you could, in this context, you could just put it as physical phenomena. Uh, so uh, he rejects the idea that physical things happen for any for the sake of something. They just happen because they're caused by something else. Of course, this is um, we have a modern version of this in the Newtonian uh, worldview of physics. Okay, now um, it kind of goes like this. It goes, these philosophers, then uh, Socrates, then Plato, then Aristotle. Aristotle was a tutor to Alexander the Great. Then Alexander the, the Great died in, I think, 323 BC. I could be slightly off on that. I think it's around 323 BC. Uh, and right after that, um, four primary schools of philosophy emerged. So after the death of Alexander the Great, who conquered enormous amount of territory, the whole known world, in fact, um, uh, then his empire collapsed immediately following his death into warring factions, uh, which created massive political strife. And uh, you have the emergence of these four kind of groups in response to this uh, political conflict. Uh, so we've got the Cynics, the Skeptics, the Epicureans, and the Stoics. I won't be covering them in much detail. I'll just mention them now. So just keep in mind that when I discuss this, I am skipping ahead. I'm skipping way ahead. I'm skipping from past this, past Socrates, past Plato, past Aristotle. So about 150 years, maybe 100 years. Um, cynics, you know, I actually had a book. Um, the book I would recommend for this is Story of Philosophy by Brian McGee. Really excellent introduction to, um, to philosophy. Uh, and you can actually find pages on each of these there, so I, I won't go into detail now. You've probably heard of the famous figures uh, in these, though. Um, Diogenes, uh, Pyrrho, Pyrrho uh, Epicurus, and Zeno, or Marcus Aurelius. And I've put these such that they correspond. So Diogenes was a cynic. Um, cynics basically rejected the uh, civilized life. They thought that they were kind of overwhelmed by all the... Uh, civilization. They said, this. we don't have actually have any reason to live this way. Um, there's a very funny story about Alexander the Great. Um, he just conquered the whole known world. He was the most powerful person ever. Um, and he was very wise. He wasn't, um, he was actually tutored by Aristotle briefly in his uh, teenage years. But he had just conquered the whole known world and he had, um, he was a great admirer of uh, Diogenes, this philosopher, the, the cynic, and he went to find Diogenes, who was living in a cave and living literally like an animal. And he found Diogenes and he's basically like, oh, I'm such a big fan, you know, um, what can I do for you? And Diogenes replies, uh, you can stop blocking the light to my cave, you know. So it shows the, the, the indifference of the cynics to uh, sort of worldly temptations, they just rejected all of that completely. Um, skeptics, uh, skeptics, of course, that, you know, when the person is skeptical, they're unsure of something. So skeptics in the extreme philosophic sense means they just deny all knowledge. Knowledge is impossible and I know it. Uh, the Epicureans, uh, they, I believe they, uh, yeah, so they basically focused on a life of pleasure. Won't go, I won't go into too much detail on that. And uh, Stoics were, well, you've probably heard of Stoicism. It's a, a philosophy that's on the rise uh, today. And it's the idea that you should, the main idea being that you should distinguish between things you can control and things you can't. And you just uh, set aside the things and make peace with, with the things you can't control and focus exclusively on the things you can. That, uh, and of course, there's all these other ideas like uh, the comfort. Comfort is irrelevant. Um, you should be seeking virtue. Um, and of course, Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, uh, was uh, himself a, a stoic and didn't live at all like other emperors did. Slept on the floor and all of that. Uh, Zeno was the uh, originator of stoicism. Okay. And actually, on Zeno, he an interesting, he puts forward an interesting paradox. So the character of Achilles was invented by Homer. Uh, he was around in sort of about seven to 600 BC, Homer. You know, he wrote the Iliad, the Odyssey. Uh, and Achilles was a major character in this. He was a warlike uh, warrior and a hero. 
And he, Zeno puts it this way, he says, okay, so all the Greeks were very well versed in Homer. Uh, they were basically educated on the Homeric texts. He says, imagine that Achilles and a tortoise are having a race. And these are the rules. Uh, Achilles runs twice as fast as the tortoise. Frankly, an insult to Achilles if you consider how slowly a tortoise moves. But, uh, you know, let's just, for the sake of this, say he's running twice as fast. Um, and so the tortoise, they give the tortoise a significant head start. Now, he says, okay, given this formula, each time Achilles reaches the tortoise's previous point, the tortoise will have moved half of that distance further along. So the tortoise moves at half the speed that Achilles does, always. So Achilles moves one meter, the tortoise moves half a meter, and so on. Now by this logic, Achilles doesn't ever catch up, even though he's always running twice as fast. Um, for those who want a visualization, that's kind of what it looks like. So isn't that interesting? Uh, there is, of course, a solution to why this is the case. It has to do with the relative adjustment of their speeds. But um, this, is, uh, this is the sort of thing that Aristotle would refer to as a sort of hypothetical infinity. So Aristotle uh, put forward the idea that infinity doesn't exist in reality. Infinity just refers to potential. It refers, for example, to the potential number of times you could cut something in half. You know, you could do that, keep going and keep going infinitely. But whenever you stop, you still have a finite number of pieces. Uh, and it, it, here you you actually have uh, they, they're both reducing their speed. Uh, actually, it doesn't matter, but their speed is just relatively set up such that um, uh, the tortoise is always ahead. So uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the general uh, Greek approach to life and to science. Now I wrote here conceptual thought. Uh, but it's a little bit of a misnomer because, in fact, all thought is conceptual. You can't have non-conceptual thought. Um, just to explain what conceptual means, perceptual means perceptual level. So percept is a specific thing you observe with one of your five senses. So I'm right now looking at my laptop. Uh, this is a percept. This specific laptop is a percept. But the concept of laptop, that's a, uh, a concept. So uh, it means I'm emitting the measurements of a laptop for example, my laptop is black, uh, but a laptop doesn't have to be black. It can be any other color. So I'm omitting that measurement. I'm also omitting the measurements of the dimensions of this laptop uh, and its functionalities and so on. And I'm just uh, defining a laptop as a, as a computer that closes, right? A computer that can fold in half and close. Um, and then, of course, that requires other concepts like folding and computer. Uh, but a concept is the idea of that subsumes a hypothetically unlimited number of percepts, which means specific pieces of sensory data, under a single idea, and we give that idea a word, and that's kind of how we communicate. So whenever we communicate, it's always conceptual. I mean, the only exceptions I could think to this are when you, when you don't use words in communication. When you, uh, for example, hurt and you go, ow, um, you're, you're reacting to a perceptual stimulus. You're not conveying anything conceptual. Um, but when we communicate as humans do, we communicate um, conceptually. Uh, okay, so Greece, of course, had a great admiration for this. And I, oh, I actually don't have this. Um, this is a great book I recommend on, uh, on Greece. It's called Greek Science and Antiquity by Marshall Clagg at 1955. I gave it a read recently. Very highly recommended. I wish I had the quote right now, but um, I don't. So um, I'll see if I can find the page for those of you who are interested, uh, in particular, that I wanted to read. OK, so very brief word on science. Uh, now let's look at literature. Uh, literature, of course, is a form of art. And I've chosen literature because it's very hard to discuss things like statues or uh, paintings or whatever. It's just, it's very hard to put that in conceptual terms. I could do it, but it would, it would take up a lot of time and it would require a number of leaps. So let's just discuss literature because it is the written word. Uh, and that's of course very easy to discuss verbally. 
Um, now, Greek art, if you look at modern art, I don't understand modern art at all. It either represents, in my mind, uh, something really depraved, or it represents nothing at all. If you just look at the smears on canvases that are, that, um, are around our museums, they have no meaning to anyone, and people who pretend otherwise are just pretending. Uh, because there's no, there's nothing to observe there. There's nothing representational at all. Um, now, Greek art is characterized by exactly the opposite of this. It wants to celebrate life. Uh, it wants to say, look how wonderful it is that we are living on this earth, that we are such, such interesting beings. There's a quote from Homer, uh, numberless are the world's wonders, but none more wonderful than man. Uh, so I'd just like to quote Homer on a couple other points because this is, of course, the uh, seminal you know, uh, Greek poet and playwright. Any moment might be our last. Everything is more beautiful because we are doomed. You will never be lovelier than you are now. We will never be here again. Now, this may sound actually hopeless on first glance, but he's basically saying the finitude of life is what gives it all this incredible color and uh actually right before that he says the gods envy us because we are mortal i just didn't include it there uh so in a minute i'll discuss the greek attitude to gods and it's of course we hear about the uh, ancient greeks being religious but they were not religious in the christian sense of the word they didn't consider themselves subordinate to god or god's will uh, they considered that an occasional hindrance um all right oh. okay this is from the odyssey um all right so there's a scene in the odyssey i think i actually mentioned this last week uh and now i've got the quote for you properly uh odysseus finds achilles dying on the battlefield the top quote here is from Odysseus, and the bottom quote is from Achilles. So he's he's reassuring Achilles that he shouldn't be afraid of death, uh, because there's not a man in the world more blessed than you. Blessed here means blessed by the gods. Um, we are gods honored you as a god. Now down here you lorded over the dead. In, you lorded over the dead in all your power. So he's offering Achilles this sort of divine power over the dead in his death. And he's saying, don't worry about dying. You're going to be this great king uh, in, in the afterlife. So grieve no more at dying, great Achilles. And we see, uh, what does Achilles reply? Does he say, uh, oh, great, I've always wanted to be a tyrant. Um, nothing like it. He says, no winning words, so don't say anything positive about dying to me. By God, I'd rather slave on earth for another man some dirt poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive, then rule down here over all the breathless dead. So he's, he's saying that he loves his life and he loves the earth so much that he would rather live as the slave of a poor, of a poor tenant farmer, which was considered a great disgrace in ancient Greece, uh, than to be the god and the ruler of all those who have died. And I think this is, it, it just reflects how, how much they loved life in Greece. This was the this is kind of the defining feature of their culture, is this worship of the individual. Of course, they, they weren't individualists in any, in any modern sense. Of course, they owned slaves and all of that. But I'm talking about their sort of basic feelings towards life and the universe. All right. So... On uh, this topic of gods and religion in ancient Greece, there is this word arete, and they effectively believe that arete was a form of, it was the word they used for virtue. And uh, it referred to effectively a person reaching their, their height, their uh, metaphysical excellence, perfectly performing their function. Uh, full realization of potential. So I've given a few different ways it can be translated. It's a Greek word, so we won't get a perfect translation in English, but uh, that is sort of what they extolled as virtuous. Now, I'm reading here from uh, the dim hypothesis for those online. I've got, I've got the book here. This is the book uh, we will be covering in our very last week. 
in the future, uh, future of philosophy. Uh, I'm quoting from page 186 to 187. Um, the gods, so this is all about Greece and uh, their attitude to gods. Quote, Okay, in presenting the epic of Achilles going on strike because of the injustice done to him, Homer is convinced above all to tell a story. The main figures do reveal their inner lives and often speak poetically and with passion, but the primary content of the work is the actions and results in the physical world brought about by their inner lives and public speeches. Expropriation, revenge, strategy, battle, death, victory. In a play, as Aristotle later explained the Greek approach, quote, they do not act to portray the characters. They include the characters for the sake of the action. The first essential, the life and soul, so to speak, of tragedy is the plot. Okay, I'll just do one more quote. <clears throat> Right, so this is, again, about their attitude towards gods. They, they basically regarded them as nuisances. Uh, the gods' intervention in the action and the character's obeisances to Zeus's unlimited power are all over Homer's story. Despite this, however, the gods have no real effect on the story. For example, Zeus, who is supposed to, Zeus, who is supposed to have ordained the war's outcome, so he predetermined the outcome of the, the whole war that this book is about, um, the Odyssey, uh, sorry, the, the Iliad, I'm actually not sure if it's the Odyssey or the Iliad, one of them. Um, yeah, who is supposed to preordained uh, the war's outcome is a pathetic omnipotence. At one point, he complains that he doesn't know what to do. At another, he is seduced and drugged by his nagging wife, who denounces him to his face as a tyrant. Meanwhile, the primary concern of the lesser gods is rivalry over their status in the divine pecking order. It is it is hardly a surprise, therefore, to see a human character now and then openly defying the gods when their whim gets in his way, and doing so without a moral qualm, without penalty, and with Homer's seeming approval. Okay, I'll leave it there because you didn't all just come kind of, here to listen to me read a book, but um, I hope that gives you the idea. Uh, just a quick summary of everything I've effectively uh, lectured on now. We've covered these points, and now I hope you have some, some knowledge of these. Let's move on to questions, uh, and then we'll do a break followed by a group activity. Um, I'll take questions from anybody here in person first, to thank you for braving the weather, and then we'll do some online questions. Okay. Sorry? I have a question about so yeah. about this. Um, I don't know who said that, but like um, someone said, the history of thought is about the rivalry between the philosophy the philosopher and the self. Is hmm. what, what do you think about that? Yeah, sure. I'll just repeat it for the online people. Yeah. Um, the questioner here uh, in person just asked that uh, he, he quoted an unknown quote. You, yeah, okay. So there's somebody who wrote, um, the history of philosophy is a, a debate or a battle between uh, the sophists and the philosophers, something like that, yeah? You're asking what I have to say about that? Yeah, um, well, sophism is a form of skepticism and subjectivism. So it's the idea that knowledge is impossible, which is, of course, a contradictory claim because you're claiming knowledge of that itself. Uh, but people can make an exception. They say, I know nothing except that I know. I know that I know nothing, like, which is exactly what Socrates said. Um, so yes, I agree, because the uh, sophistry and subjectivism and you know, uh, uh, skepticism is, in fact, a denial of objective reality. It's saying, you know, we're not going to consider what is actually there or that anything is there. We're going to reject the fact that there is an objective reality. Uh, and uh, we're just going to break knowledge into pieces, which is, of course, contradicted by every scientific achievement. Because you go, well, was it the sophists who build bridges? Is it the sophists who invent medicines that prolong our lives? 
is like that is all based on uh, an objective knowledge of uh, the machinations of the universe, which can be reached through an objective method, which was actually provided to us by Aristotle. So I agree, it is a, that we are in a battle, and we've all, we, we will always be in a battle between those who claim that knowledge is impossible and those who claim that knowledge, um, by the way, it's not just between those who say knowledge is impossible and knowledge is possible, because a subset of those who say knowledge is possible, if not most of them, claim that it's knowable by some other method than reason. So they say, yeah, we have knowledge because God tells me the truth. To hell with, you know, uh, uh, the periodic table. I know that when the earth was created, you know, because it tells me in the Bible. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, no, that's a very good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Have you heard or read about by Aristophanes? It was usually. Have, have I? No, I have no. It was usually positive in getting somebody skilled. Right. Because it shows him teaching youths to to disrespect the gods. Yes, yeah. disrespect. Okay. That's all right. I can I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. 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 They both in the Greeks a lot. So they basically think you can fight them, but they also think you do have to respect them. And they live in fear of them. Because at any minute they could turn yeah. on you and kill you. Yeah. yeah, but of course you'll observe that it wasn't gods who killed Socrates, it was other people. Uh, in this case, yeah. in that one case, it was because Aristotle painted him mm. as teaching you to disrespect. Yeah, that's true. Um, that, that's true. Uh, Aristotle, one of the charges he was uh, tried on was, um, well, one was corrupting the youth and the other was worshipping false gods or worshipping no gods, uh, which he said, well, which is it? He was kind of one of his defenses was, am I worshipping the wrong gods or am I worshipping no gods? Um, yeah, but well, I don't want to, we'll actually get to that today. So let's, um, do you have a question? All right, um, I'll take some online questions and then we'll do our break. Just before we move on to the life and death of Socrates, I'm going to give you a uh, poem, which is written well after ancient Greece. It was written by uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. So I think it was about 19th century, one of my favorite poets. Um, and I'd like you to identify what it is in this poem that, uh, well, well, we'll just get to the, the slide. Just look at the very bottom. What attitude to knowledge does this poem reflect? How does this relate to Greek epistemology? As, as we've just discussed it. So I'll read it once uh, to give you the kind of intonation and then you can uh, discuss among yourselves. This, as I said, Alfred Lord Tennyson, great poet. Flower in the crannied wall, I pluck you out of the crannies. A cranny, by the way, is a small crack in a wall. So in this, in this case, so it's like a small kind of, uh, like, you know, nooks and crannies. So it's like a small crack basically. And so this is a flower growing from this crack in a wall in presumably an old building and it's the observer holding it flower in the crannied wall i pluck you out of the crannies i hold you here root and all in my hand little flower but if i could understand what you are root and all and all in all i should know what god and man is okay great so five minutes to discuss there he is. He's portrayed as very strong. This is completely inaccurate. Um, Socrates is the, the one who's pointing up with his hand over the goblet. That gobl goblet is supposed to contain the hemlock. This is his execution. Hemlock is a uh, poison. And he was forced to die by drinking that hemlock. Uh, this is a, I actually don't know who painted this, but it's a very famous painting. It's called The Death of Socrates, quite appropriately. And uh, you see Socrates has this uh, uh, sort of musculature and very kind of virtuous look to him. He was in fact quite ugly. Uh, so he didn't look like that at all, uh, except for the face. And uh, there's actually a great analysis of this painting on a, there's a YouTube channel, what's it called? Um, is it Nerdwriter? I think maybe it's Nerdwriter. There's, there's a really great um, analysis of this painting from about five or six years ago. So I would recommend uh, watching that. So I'll just give you some basic biographical details of Socrates. Those are his dates. Now remember when it's BC, you're kind of going backwards, you're going back to zero. 
So um, he died at the age of what, 70, 71? Um, all right. Born in Athens, he was the first moral philosopher. So before him, uh, we discussed Thales and Heraclitus and Parmenides. These were all uh, thinkers concerned with uh, making the concrete abstract. They wanted to understand the, the kind of concepts that united all of reality. And uh, Heraclitus said, it's nothing, it's just change. It's just change all over. Parmenides said, no, you have to have something undergoing the change. Uh, so it's entities, and then there are processes. Didn't explain how those processes occur. I mean, he kind of did, but it was, it was completely wrong. Um, now, Socrates was an Athenian through and through, born in Athens, and he died in Athens, and he only left three times in his life. And the Peloponnesian, always on military campaigns for the Peloponnesian War, that war was a war between Athens and Sparta. Uh, Sparta ended up winning, and after Sparta won, I think it was in 404 BC, um, they, they had instantiated the tyranny of the 30, which was, they, they uh, removed, is that correct, the dates? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, but the tyranny of the 30. Okay, yeah, so uh, the tyranny of the 30 was uh, established. Before that, Athens was a democracy. Uh, by democracy, they had their own version of it, but effectively a democracy. And uh, they removed that whole assembly, and uh, Sparta chose 30 tyrants. Effectively, Sparta approved tyrants to rule over all of Athens. Um, it ended like all dictatorships end in blood and slaughter. It though it wasn't too too bad, it was, all the tyrants were removed from power, and uh, democracy was reinstated. Uh, now, Plato actually writes about this period of the tyranny of the 30, which only lasted about two years, uh, or maybe even less. Um, and he writes about uh, his frustration with democracy and, and how he reflected on that in light of the dictatorship that the tyranny of the 30 had imposed on Athens. Plato was a young man. Uh, by the time Socrates died, he was in he was 27 or 29, I think, when Socrates died, and he had known Socrates for some time by then, and he was his greatest student. Uh, all right. Anyway, back to Socrates. So I'm going to just focus on two aspects of Socrates today: the Socratic method and uh, what he had to say about morality. Well, three three aspects: the Socratic method, what he had to say about rea uh, about morality, and uh, so Socrates' death. Speaking of which, he was, uh, I covered all this. Now, the charges for his trial, which lasted a whole day, was were worshipping false gods and corrupting the youth of Athens. And the other interesting thing about Socrates is he was purely verbal and he was an orator. He never wrote anything. And that's why we can't really trust anything we get about Socrates because it all comes from Plato. And uh, we'll see that we'll see next week when we cover Plato that uh, his early dialogues. So a dialogue is basically a conversation between Socrates and somebody else. The, the name of the dialogue is the other person that Socrates is talking to, or one of the people that he's talking to. Uh, so, for example, you've got the Timaeus and all of that. Now, the going theory in the history of philosophy is that the early dialogues following so Socrates' death are um, made up in a sense, they're all made up, but the character of Socrates is more or less accurate. Meaning if Socrates were put in this position and he were asked these kinds of questions, Plato is quite faithful to how Socrates would reply. But as we go further along in Plato's career, there is the understanding that he probably started putting his own views into the character of Socrates and that Socrates may not necessarily have held any of these views. Um, so it's a, it's a progression, uh, but again, when we want to understand who Socrates himself was, as opposed to who Plato was, we should look at the early Socratic dialogues, not the late ones. Uh, okay, so there we go. There's also Xenophon. Um, we won't be covering him. <clears throat> so, what is the Socratic method? It's a method of argument, <laughs> obviously. Uh, it's a, it's a, a way of just asking questions. What does this involve? Firstly, what it doesn't involve is trying to prove something. It's not about uh, trying to advance my position. It's, it is, can be useful for testing a position that you already believe you have, but it does not itself uh, establish 
a truth of any kind, really. It's it's much more playful and kind of um, deliberative, although it can be very antagonistic at times. So speaking of the antagonism, this is what makes it antagonistic. The fact that what you're trying to do is trying to get the person to contradict themselves in their own terms. So you're not introducing anything else from the outside uh, that they don't accept. You're using already what they do accept uh, to show them that their own views are self-contradictory, that they actually can't have everything they want because of the way they're defining their terms. So uh, Socrates was very humble in uh, the epistemic respect, as I said. He said, um, I know that I know nothing. Uh, there, is, there is a more full uh, way of saying that, but that's the, that's the shorthand. Um, so he does acknowledge at the beginning that I don't know. I don't know, I'm just gonna ask you questions. But he does prove that through the, the questioning and the interrogation via the Socratic method that the person talking to him doesn't know either, even if they claim at the outset to be an expert. So let's get to the steps of what the Socratic method involves. Uh, you would begin by asking, what is the thing that we're gonna be discussing? So what is virtue, what is justice? What is justice that's asked uh, Oh, is it virtue or justice? One of those is asked in the Mino uh, dialogue. James, I think, knows this one. Um, <laughs> so it was it was either what is justice or what is virtue. Uh, the Mino dialogue starts off that way. Uh, that was that was one of Plato's dialogues about Socrates. <clears throat> so he says, okay, you've given me a definition of this thing we're going to be discussing. And you've given me a definition of justice. For example, I remember in the Republic, which is a very famous uh, dialogue by Plato. Uh, the definition given of justice by maybe it was Thrasymachus or maybe somebody else. Polymachus was it Polymachus? Maybe it was Polymachus. That is definitely a character in the Republic. Uh, anyway, it was one of the characters in the Republic. Um, says, "Well, justice is giving to each person what he is owed." Okay. Now, and then Socrates comes up with a counterexample and he says, well, okay, let's say you borrowed, I think I made this example last week. Let's say you borrowed knives from a friend. They are in a bad state of mind. You owe them the knives and then they ask for the knives back. Now, you, you are suspecting that they will hurt themselves or somebody else with this. It's not going to be good for them. And this friend has never done anything wrong. Would it be just to give the knives back at that moment? After all, you did define justice as returning what is owed. So then the just man would give back the knives and uh, the, the unjust man, and of course, I do say man because that is the, the way that they discussed it back then. Um, <clears throat> so he would ask for examples. Um, he, he doesn't have to go straight for the kill in this instance. So in the case of justice, it was just too obvious the reply he could make because the definition given by the uh, interlocutor, whoever it was, Polymachus or Thrasymachus, was just too easy to take apart. But sometimes uh, people give better answers. And there he asked them for examples. So at this point, he's just, he's not even attacking them. He's just asking questions. He's trying to get them to really reveal the full position that they hold to him. And this way, he knows everything he knows. So Socrates has all of his knowledge, and now he also has all of their knowledge. He asks, where does this apply? What cases involve justice? For example, let's take justice. He says, give me an example of justice. You say, okay, well, uh, a criminal is convicted. That's an example of justice. Okay, where would it apply? Would it apply in a case where innocent people are harmed? He says, yes. What if they're harmed by natural disaster, not by the actions of another person? Would this be an instance where we should apply the issue of justice? So again, that's kind of probing the underlying concepts. He's saying, does justice involve only man-made issues or also natural issues? For example, is it unjust that people die when they get old, even if they've lived a good life? Is that is that an issue of justice or is that something we should uh, consider immune to the whole issue of justice? So what he's doing here is he's just accumulating examples. So at this point, Socrates knows everything, at least that's relevant to the issue that the interlocutor holds. Oftentimes the interlocutor is somebody claiming to be an expert in the matter. And he understands these issues. Now, what does he do? Socrates basically, he doesn't, of course, he doesn't write anything. He just speaks the whole time. But I don't think it's possible to do this 
uh, in practice, unless you have an amazing memory without writing these points down. Um, but you, he begins to basically cross-reference everything the person said with everything else they said. And they st he starts looking for things that contradict each other. Uh, now, when we start doing this, there are a few different options. Firstly, you can say, um, you can come up with something really obvious, like uh, the definition you gave here is different to the definition you gave here for the same thing. So, okay, that's, that's easy. Where can it be more complicated? Uh, it can be, you say that an example provided doesn't, uh, it, it does it, it does adhere to the definition provided, but it contradicts common sense ideas. Now, the example I gave with the knife is, is this. So he's saying, you define justice as everybody getting what they deserve. If you give the knives back to this madman, you are giving him what you owe him. So there's nothing wrong with that. According to you, that's justice. But it contradicts the interlocutor's own ideas about justice because the interlocutor says, well, no, of course you wouldn't give the knives in that, issue, in that instance. Um, uh, so it contradicts common sense conceptions of that subject. Another way you can do this, uh, you can say the definition is just is just too broad or too narrow. You say, um, for example, you could define justice as um, uh, righting wrongs, right? right? Correcting everything that's been done badly. But so, okay, so if, if you see a, somebody doing a job that you're not responsible for and they're doing it badly, does that mean you jump in and start helping them without their permission, you know? Um, even if it's none of your business, that can be uh, too, well, it's hard to say if it's too broad or too narrow, but it clearly applies in cases where justice doesn't arise according to common sense conceptions. Uh, or you can put it as uh, justice is, um, you know, bringing criminals into courts. It's like, okay, but that's not, doesn't cover all of justice. What if there's no courts? What if there's no criminals? Uh, what if you are unable to bring the criminal into the court? Does justice apply in non-criminal issues? Does it mean that only crimes are it matters of justice? Okay, and another one is an example provided may not relate to a context in which the subject would apply it, yet it is intuitively an instance of the subject. I had it, I, I knew what I was saying when I wrote this, and now I've it seems to have slipped my mind. An example provided may not relate to a context in which the subject would apply it. Okay, I think we'll just move on from that. But if anybody understands it, well, well done, because I, I, I forgot what I was going to say about that. I had, an I had an example in mind. This is why I should provide examples. Um, oh, right. Yeah, okay. So if you define the context too narrowly and you say justice applies in public matters but not in private matters, for example, you, you give it a definition that says it's only in public matters, um, then you could say, well, an example is uh, a person is in a loving relationship and they cheat on the partner. That's a private matter. It doesn't go to the public court, at least not in our current society. Um, yet it is intuitively an instance of injustice. Like, why, why would you do that? It's, it's, it, you've committed an injustice against the partner. That's just an example. Okay. Now, okay, so Socrates, that's basically the Socratic method. Now, should we say that Socrates was just a skeptic, that he uh, rejected everybody else's definitions of everything and showed why they contradict themselves and was a master of just taking arguments apart? But does this mean he believed in nothing? Except thinking for yourself, of which he was a great advocate. Right? Not quite. So he does actually have some positive ideas, positive meaning asserting something rather than just rejecting something. This is one of his key ideas. Virtue through knowledge is the purpose of life and everybody has a duty to themselves to preserve their personal integrity. So this is of course um, really uh, relevant to his death. When he was being tried, in the months leading up to his trial and even on the day before, he was given every opportunity to escape Athens. Uh, there, everything was prepared for him to um, go into exile and run away. And in fact, that was, a, that was an option. He, uh, for better or for worse, um, he probably wouldn't be as famous if he had fled, but he would have survived longer. <clears throat> uh, he rejected that. He said, no, uh, I have simply used my mind to the best of my ability. I've preached the ideas I consider to be correct. 
I've uh, just used my reason. If you consider that a uh, sufficient warrant to put me to death, then so be it. And he was, uh, oh, we'll get to this point in a second. So again, I recommended everybody read The Story of Philosophy by Brian McGee. Uh, and he summarizes Socrates' uh, point on uh, morality like this, that personal corruption consists in corruption of the soul. This may seem sensible if you define soul as the mind or the, the character or something to do with the integrity of the individual. Um, but it actually excludes from consideration things like the body. So it means that your body is just a vessel for your mind and it's, it's more or less irrelevant. Uh, although I believe Socrates did preach um, a form of, uh, the importance of uh, physical excellence, uh, arete. This is one of his most famous quotes. And of course, if he believes that the uh, integrity of the soul is all that matters, then he wouldn't attribute any significance to material rewards uh, or acquisitions. Right, now this is really interesting. Uh, all virtue is based in knowledge. So it's impossible for a person, this is actually something Socrates believed, it is impossible for a person to do wrong willingly that every time a person commits a sin of some kind it's because they don't understand what's in their interests so uh that that's of course a very controversial point i don't agree with it but that that is what socrates holds and so far as they've been yeah so the fact that uh people act in their interests is just a fact of nature to the greeks this is not a fact of nature to us some people can act very consciously against their own interests uh, but even Plato, uh, who was very much not an individualist, uh, did believe that a person will, to the best of their ability, serve their own life. Uh, and so if they are doing something that is not virtuous, they are the ones who will suffer from that, by the way that uh, Socrates defines virtue. So, uh, again, one can never benefit from the commission of a vice. To suffer injustice is less harmful than to commit it. So it's never in your interest to commit uh, injustice to a, against another person because it's also committing the injustice against yourself. Yeah, so all immorality is a form of ignorance. Everything we call malevolence to Socrates was just people not knowing well enough. And so he sought to, to educate them, but also in a kind of uh, manner where he was himself open to being corrected. Next week... We have Plato, will be uh, exact same place, exact same time, uh, and you can register there via the link.